Life Church. We're a community that has found forgiveness, hope, in Jesus Christ. And we welcome you to be here today. You guys want to stand with us?
Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it
Yeah. 
Jesus, with your name comes power, comes the Holy Spirit, and we are so grateful, Lord, for all of the blessings, all the forgiveness, all the inheritance, all the transformation that you offer. We thank you for your care, your consistency, your stability, your heart. We thank you for the good work you're doing in our lives, Lord, as we submit to you, as we surrender to you as our Lord, as our Savior, as our King. As you change our hearts, Lord, and give us new passions, and you give us new thoughts for our minds, new thinking and new perspectives, Lord. We thank you for your kingdom, God. It is the true kingdom, the strong kingdom that grows ever stronger each day. I thank you that we could be here with one another, Lord brothers and sisters in your family. And we commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremiah, and welcome to church. If you are new here, we have this blue connect card that you can fill out to stay connected. Make sure to drop it off at Guest Central after the gathering to receive an awesome welcome gift. A lot of events are happening within the next few weeks. Be sure to check out the bulletin and our website at lcmh.info for everything that's going down. Here's what to plan for. Immediately after the gathering today is the annual chili cook-off. Join us as we enjoy great food and even better fellowship. The cost is $5 per adult, $3.50 for kids 12 and under, and no family will pay over $20 to attend. All proceeds will go to supporting the women's ministry. Now is the time for everyone to take your tongues. Let's get ready to feast. Operation Christmas Child is right around the corner. This is a ministry that collects shoebox gifts for children in need around the world. Each box is prayerfully and uniquely packed, full of toys and other fun items to delight the heart of a child. Make sure to pick up your boxes outside of Guest Central to fill up and return by November 14th. Make sure to check out SamaritansPurse.org to get instructions on how to fill the box properly. We're excited to let you know that we'll be installing a really great new playground for all the kiddos to enjoy, both at the church and for the school. If you would like to contribute towards its purchase and installation, please do so online at lcmh.info slash give. And as always, Family Night will continue to go strong this Wednesday with a lot going on. We have the discipleship track, shape class, 
youth group, and the nursery all ready for you to come out and enjoy a time of fellowship. Check out our website to learn more about all of the other events going on around here, like weekly Bible studies and the women's community outing, which is happening this Saturday. That's all I have for you today. Let's take this time to quickly make sure our cell phones are on silent. And if you are needing another environment to watch the service, feel free to check out the cafe or one of the mother's rooms where we are always live streaming the service. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the gathering. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Those watching online, thank you for taking time and streaming the Life Church Gathering. We're excited to be here, and we're excited about you being here as well. So uh, make yourself at home. Enjoy the time that we're gathering together, for sure. Hey, next Sunday is our water baptismal celebration. And um, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a class, and um, before we go on. I just want to encourage you, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized in water, um, I just want to encourage you to do that. And if, if you didn't go to the class or you went to the class and you're procrastinating, pull the trigger, man. Say, yes, I am going to be baptized in water because the New Testament church, when people placed their faith in Christ, they went public with it by declaring their faith before their family, their friends, saying, I have put my trust in Jesus and I'm going to follow him the rest of my life. Water baptism is that public declaration. So if you missed the class and you'd like more information, you can see Pastor Travis after the gathering today and say, man, I want to get dunked next Sunday. Everybody good with that? Yeah, yeah man. Don't go to sleep tonight without... Saying yes, pulling, you know, making that decision. That's, that's pretty cool. So just want to mention that. Also today, we have Jay and Amy Siegert, uh, part of the Starting Point Project. Uh, we really don't need to say a whole lot about them because uh, they come every year um, at Life Church. And here's the deal, friends. Our country, the world, uh, they're drifting drifting spiritually, and there are Christian institutions that are compromising uh, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to uh, the trust factor and believing everything the Bible has to say, and it's being undercut by deception. That's why we enjoy Jay coming to kind of put clarity on that for all of us. I don't know about you, but I want to stay true to Jesus Christ. All the way to the finish line, man. How about it? Yeah, man. So, so um, Jay's got another mini announcement when he comes up. We were talking about it before the gathering. Uh, man, there, is, there are so many things on shifting sands where the truth is being compromised. And friends, we need to stay in God's word and we need to live by God's word all the days of our life. And so uh, following the gathering, uh, we've got offering boxes. You've got envelopes nearby. On the bottom of those offerings, it says other. You can write J. You can write the starting point, whatever. Let's be generous in our giving to that ministry. It's a lifeline, friends. It really is. It's a lifeline to truth. And we want to support them in every way we can. So let's give a warm welcome to Jay as he comes and shares God with you. Well, good morning. Uh, it's always a joy to be back here. Most of you know me well enough. Um, I'm not going to go over my whole background. I'll give you a, maybe a, a mini version in just a second, but I'm glad that my wife Amy is able to be here with me this time. She comes sometimes. She's... Although she did tell me the only reason she's here today is because you guys are having chili afterwards. So. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, the mini announcement when I was talking to Pastor Bob, I mentioned a, a custom talk that I put together recently. There was a conference out on the West Coast, and they wanted me to address the topic of the myth of settled science. And I, I comment on that a lot, but I didn't have an entire talk. So I, I put an entire presentation together, 
gave it for the conference. Then I was at the Great Lakes Prophecy Conference, uh, actually here in Appleton, uh, about a month ago, and gave the talk there as well. And it's just gone over really well because it deals with um, this myth of settled science. Basically what happens in many, many, many different areas, they say, they tell us that they've done the research, it's settled, time for debate is over, it's time for action now, and then they give us the marching orders, and you have to do what they're telling you, or you don't believe in science, and then they shame you, and they shut you down, and cancel you, and all that. And that's really intimidating for a lot of Christians. And so, um, when I come back next time, I think I'll be giving a talk called The Myth of Settled Science, and it'll help you deal with all the things that they're throwing our way, which are, are difficult to, to deal with, but would you understand God's word yeah. makes it a lot easier. And, and we're going to be doing that uh, today also with um, my talk. The talk this morning is called, um, Who Am I? There we go. And my own church, I, you know, we live in, in Waukesha, which isn't too far from here, and we go to a church called Spring Creek Church in Pewaukee, and there we're doing a series. And the first week of the series was, Who is Jesus? That's like the most important question. So they were starting out with that, and one of the pastors took that week. They said the second one of the series was going to be, who am I? And they contacted me and said, you know, if you're going to be in town, could you handle that one? And I said, yeah, I could probably come up there and tell people a little bit about myself. You know? <laughs> they said, no, no, <laughs> it's not who you are, it's who, who we are. Said, oh, I said, that might even be better, you know, so... <laughs> So I actually put a custom talk together that was the first time I ever gave it, and it was, I've given it a, a couple times now, so it's still pretty new to me. But I think it's really important to have this grounding with everything that's been thrown our way, and we'll see what those things are here in just a second. It's really important to know who we are. And our origins are very important too, because our origin, what you believe about your origin, determines what you believe about your purpose in life <clears throat> and your destiny. So the, this, this is just very fundamental things. Some of it will be review, some of it will be new, but I think it will be very powerful to get you grounded in the world that we're living in today. And before I go through the details of this, just for those of you who might not know me very well, the short version is I was born in Waukesha, grew up at a non-denominational Bible church, a very solid um, believed the Bible from cover to cover all the way through high school. I went to college for engineering at a Christian college, and everything was great there. But then I, after the, the engineering degree, I decided to get a degree in physics and went to Whitewater. And Whitewater, as you may know, is not a Christian university. And all my professors were telling me I was wrong about everything that I believed. And I knew what I believed at that point in my life, but I didn't know why. So God put it in my heart to start looking into things. So I have been looking into things and speaking for 36 years now, which is weird because I'm just 37 years old, so how does that work? <laughs> um, but no, it's been, it's, it's amazing, 36 years of researching and speaking and started out local, then it went across the nation, and now I've been in eight other countries as well. So with that background, uh, we're going to be launching into this talk here. There are two approaches to looking at this thing of answering the question of who am I, you know, who are you, who are we? One is looking at man's wisdom, all the wisdom and knowledge that man has built up over the years. The second one would be God's word and God's wisdom. You might have an idea of which one I lean towards <laughs> very heavily. I'd suggest that we get who we are from what God tells us about all this. But answering this question about who is Jesus, which was the first week in the series, very important. I can summarize that whole thing. Jesus is exactly who he said he is. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. He is God himself. And because Jesus is who he said he is, we are exactly who he said we are. We are created in the image of God. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're fellow heirs with Christ. We're the body of Christ. We are chosen, God's chosen ones. We're more than conquerors. We're God's temple. We're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We're the light of the world. We're partakers of the divine nature, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes. And, and we could go on and on and on with everything that Scripture tells us about who we are. And this really needs to be our starting point. This is what God has told us. He created us, so he should probably be in a pretty good position to tell us who we are. Well, let's take a brief look at man's wisdom. What does man say about who we are? Again, we could go over many, many, many examples uh, this is just one example from Stephen Hawking. 
He was arguably the world's leading theoretical physicist. He passed away about, I think it's been about three years now. But this is what he had to say about who we are. The human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among 100 billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. We are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe, and for that, I am extremely grateful. Now, this guy was a brilliant scientist, one of the world's leading scientists. He was also an atheist, and we could talk about this, quote, the rest of the, the service, but I'm just going to make two points here. One is he talked about the grand design. How do you have design without a designer? And then he said he's extremely grateful. <laughs> to whom or what? To particles for having banged together just the right way so now he's here and can appreciate it? How do particles appreciate anything? That's all he is. It's particles they bang around a certain, you know, long enough and then here, here he is to tell us about the entire universe. So it doesn't even make any sense and it's pretty depressing if we kept going down that path. Here's another theoretical physicist. He's one of the world's leading atheists today. He said, every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if the stars hadn't exploded. The only way for them to get in your body is if those stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Yikes. I would not want to be him on Judgment Day to have made a statement like that when he meets his creator. <laughs> It wasn't the stars that exploded that got him here. It was, it was God. But this is man's wisdom. Well, why can't we put the two together? You know, scientists are discovering some awesome stuff. You know, so we'll just take what they're telling us and some stuff from the Bible and we'll come up with the best of both worlds. That's where the majority of religious people are today. That's where many Christians are today. Oh, they, they like God and the Bible and all that, but... They hear all this other stuff and they just assume it's got to be true because these scientists are brilliant. So let's just put the two together. And I give entire talks that go into more detail on this. But well, what happens when you do that? I'm going to back up a second. I'm a little too fast here. What happens visually is, get back one slide. What happens when you put the two together is this. The Bible takes a back seat <clears throat> to man's wisdom. And often we're kind of even embarrassed, so we kind of, Pull the shades. You don't want to, anyone to realize that you kind of look at the Bible or read it or take it seriously at all. You might want to pull it out once in a while when it really helps you, but the rest of the time you just kind of keep it quiet and you, and you go mainly with, with man's wisdom. That's what happens most of the time for most people. Well, how does this happen that we water down the authority of God's Word so much? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest things has to do with a very key Hebrew word. And I bet you any money... Pastor Bob doesn't even know this word. <clears throat> it's pronounced yabut. The English translation is yabut. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not a Hebrew word. I made it up. <laughs> so you don't have to sweat anymore. <laughs> He's off the hook. <laughs> but we do this all the time. You know, we hear about the Bible. Yeah, but, you know, but I know all these other things. And from what I've heard, you know, so Genesis 3, 2, what's the first thing that happens? After God creates Adam and Eve and it's perfect, everything's going wonderfully. But then Satan gets in there and says, did God really say you can't eat of any tree in that garden? Guess what? God didn't say you can't eat of any tree in that garden. He said you can eat of any tree in the garden except for one. So Satan twisted God's word, misquoted it, took it out of context, and got Eve to doubt God's word. His plan has not changed at all today. He's doing the same thing. Even many Christians doubt God's word. Well, we know it says this, yeah, but I, you know, these scientists have proven this and they've proven that, and so it can't really mean what it says. So that's exactly what's happening today. This is Jesus in John chapter 5. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how you, will you believe my words? Jesus is like, 
saying you, you're rejecting the whole Moses thing. Well, Moses wrote about me, so if you're not going to believe him and what he told you about me, why would you believe anything that I have to say? And what were his writings, Moses' writings? Well, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, including the book of Genesis. Genesis is very, very important to us as Christians. In fact, pretty much every major doctrine we believe as Christians is founded in the book of Genesis. For example, the doctrine of sin. What is sin? Well, God created Adam and Eve in that garden, and it was perfect. They were perfect, but they disobeyed God. That's what sin is. It's disobedience to God. So the whole definition of sin goes back to the book of Genesis. Then we have death. Why is there death in the world? It's all around us. Where did that come from? Well, God created Adam and Eve in that garden. They were perfect. But they sinned. They disobeyed God. And that brought death and a curse into God's perfect creation. The whole concept of death is rooted back in the book of Genesis. Then we have marriage. Marriage is one man and one woman for life. That is highly controversial all around the world today, even in many churches, even in some Christian churches. Where did that come from? Well, God created Adam and Eve in that garden. He said it's going to be one man, one woman for life. Then we have clothing. I notice you're all wearing clothes this morning. That's a good thing. This is kind of weird, but you ever wonder like, why you put clothes on? I mean, sometimes it's kind of cool out and you want to be warmer. But when it is like the perfect temperature outside, why bother? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. They were perfect, but they sinned, disobeyed God, brought death and a curse into God's perfect creation. And clothing was just a temporary covering for their sin. It goes back to Genesis. Then we have work. Why did we work? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. And he said, Adam, I want you to till the earth, work the ground. Now, it got a lot harder for him after he sinned, but it was actually ordained by God right from the beginning. It goes back to Genesis. Then we have Jesus. Jesus is referred to as being the last Adam. If the first Adam wasn't real, what does that say about the last Adam? And then most importantly, the gospel message. What is the gospel message? Well, that Jesus Christ came and died on a cross and rose again the third day. Why? Why? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. They were perfect, but they sinned, disobeyed God, brought death and a curse into God's perfect creation, and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the only permanent solution for that problem. The gospel message actually starts back in Genesis. If we have problems with Genesis, contradictions, errors, been disproven by science, didn't really happen, we have problems with pretty much everything we believe as Christians. In fact, if Genesis is not literal history with a literal very good creation and a literal Adam and Eve, then sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, and you and I don't literally need to be saved. I hope you can start to see that this Genesis stuff is kind of important. (laughs) It's not a side topic that some people are kind of into. No, it's foundational to every single one of us here this morning. Psalm 11.3, uh, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we lose that, and it's being attacked all the time, not just the Bible, but the creation account, every single public school system and state university rejects the Genesis creation account, and most of our kids get educated there. And I'm not saying we can't send them there. I'm just saying when we do, they are destroying our foundation. They're saying it did not happen that way. There wasn't an original perfect creation with an original Adam and Eve. There was a big bang billions of years ago, and then the earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and life formed 3.8 billion years ago, and then life evolved and kept going more and more complex, and eventually mankind started to evolve about 6 million years ago and through apes, and then eventually modern man showed up about 200,000 years ago. That's what they're teaching. That is not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't fit in there at all. It's a whole other talk, but we have to realize we are losing our foundation with our kids, and then we tell them, well, you've got to believe in Jesus. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Yeah, but the Bible also says the creation thing, and you don't believe that. Well, you don't have to believe that necessarily, but you have to believe the Jesus stuff. Why? Why magically just pick Jesus out of here and be so strict with that, but everything else, oh, probably wasn't a flood, probably wasn't a creation count in six days. You just kind of get rid of that. Well, you just lost your foundation. Here's another atheist. I think this quote is very disturbing, but I think it's very logical. He said, Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution. We've got to take a, a break here just for a second. Christianity is not fighting science at all, ever. Science was birthed out of the Christian community. Right. Most major areas of science we have today were founded by Bible-believing Christians. Science owes its origins to the Christian worldview. Right. Yep. 
And secular scientists know that. They understand that's where science came from. We do not fight science. We occasionally disagree with some scientists' opinions on things. That's a whole other talk that I give. So we're not fighting science, but he used that phrase in his quote. So he says we're fighting science to the desperate end of evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin and the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. I would actually agree with that. If evolution is true, as they're teaching it in the school system, then Christianity is not true. If evolution is true, there wasn't that original perfect creation with Adam and Eve in that garden who sinned, ticked God off, got kicked out, and God says, oh great, now I've got to send my son to die for their sins. That did not happen if evolution is true. Now again, many, many, many people, even many, many, many Christians, put the two together. God used evolution. Case closed, end of story. It sounds great on the surface. Solves all the problems, right? It's actually one of the worst things you can do because you're taking a very, very poor scientific concept, evolution, putting it into Scripture, and now you really would have errors and contradictions and problems in the Bible when you do that. Again, that would be a whole other talk. So again, if we don't believe Moses, why would you believe, Jesus said, my words? Well, let's take a look at some of Jesus' words. Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I am coming soon, meaning quickly. If we're not going to believe Moses and Jesus, Jesus said he's coming back again, we wouldn't believe that either, and that's what happens. Skeptics today doubt and refuse to believe anything about the return of Christ. And this is fascinating. 2 Peter chapter 3. I've probably mentioned this before here in the past. Peter, writing about 2,000 years ago, is prophesying about our time, the end times, last days. And he's specifically talking about the skeptics who are doubting the return of Christ. I just mentioned that people are going to doubt the return of Christ. They don't believe Jesus' words. Peter said, the skeptics of our time, 2,000 years in advance, they were going to be doubting the return of Christ for two reasons. Now, you would expect those to be like two big spiritual reasons why they're not believing in the return of Christ. No. He says they're not believing in the return of Christ because they're rejecting the creation account and they're rejecting the flood. They have why? What's the connection there? That seems odd. No, not at all. By rejecting the Genesis creation account, they reject God as the ultimate authority of this world. It's his world. He created it, but they reject him as creator. The flood, what was the flood? The flood was God's judgment on mankind's sin. They reject sin. No, there's no sin to be judged or anything. So they're rejecting the flood because that was God's judgment on sin. Well, what is the return of Christ? The return of Christ is another judgment. It's going to be by fire the next time. So because they're rejecting the flood, or the creation account in the flood, they're going to reject the second coming of Christ. At one point, he's going to judge it, this world by fire, create a new heavens and new earth. Well, they reject that because they reject the other two pillars that we find in the book of Genesis. Here's some more wisdom from a surprising source. This is Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's leading atheist today. He wrote wrote the book, The God Delusion. This is fascinating. He is specifically addressing the Christians who put the two together, who say God used evolution, because he's he's big, big time into evolution. He's an atheist, so he totally, totally believes in evolution. And he gets a kick out of those Christians who say, well, we can believe in that too. Yeah, well, just our God did that. And he's like, really? Pay attention to what this atheist said about that situation. Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Because the Christians say, well, it's just a symbolic story. It's in poetry in there. It didn't really, it's not really saying it happened. That was just, it's symbolic. He goes, symbolic? So, in order to impress himself, Jesus had himself tortured and executed in vicarious punishment for a symbolic sin committed by a non-existent individual. As I said, barking mad as well as viciously unpleasant. It seems to me an odd proposition that we should adhere to some parts of the Bible story, but not to others. After all, when it comes to important moral questions, by what standards do we cherry-pick the Bible? Why bother with the Bible at all if we have the ability to pick and choose from it what is right and what is wrong? I'd pay good money to go on tour with him and say, Hey, Richard, tell everybody that thing that you said. That's from an atheist. We could learn a lot from him. There's actually some wisdom there. 
And we have a problem today. Statistics are showing us that two-thirds or more, probably more, of Christian youth are walking away from their faith before they leave college. A lot of factors going on there, but think about it. The foundation for the Christian faith is the book of Genesis and that God is a creator. We've tossed that out. Like, well, you don't necessarily have to believe it that way, even though it says that. I mean, that was written a long time ago. We didn't have science, and they just had to tell stories, you know, back then. But now we know about the Big Bang and evolution, and so those things are true. And there probably really wasn't a flood because there's no evidence, and where did all that water come from? Where did all that water go? How did Noah get all those animals on the dark? So, yeah, it probably didn't happen. It's just another story in there. So, well, maybe Jesus is just a story. And if you can get rid of Jesus, you can do anything you want with your life. And that's what the youth would like to do. They'd kind of like to live differently, but the Bible doesn't allow them. Well, either have to change their lifestyle or get rid of the Bible. <laughs> get rid of the Bible. Your professors are giving them all these reasons why they can throw it out. Filled with errors and contradictions. Been disproved by science. There's missing portions. There's extra stuff that got shoved in there. There's all these issues. There's other religious books and on and on and on. They're like, and, the, and the, our kids are like, yeah, I knew it. And they use that as an excuse to walk away. So very, very, very sad. Here's an example. This was interesting. I was at a, a very, very large church, and this church had a very, very, very large youth population, and their youth pastors were very concerned because they were seeing this trend of their, their kids walking away from their faith, and they just they didn't know what to do. So I'm talking to one of the head pastors, and he was sharing this scenario with me. It was kind of interesting. He was sharing it as if I would probably be unaware of this. And I'm thinking, no, that, that's what I deal with. And ministry deals with this quite a bit. But I, I let him share the details. And after he talked about this, <clears throat> he asked me, he goes, how can I help him? And here was my response. You can't. And he looked, he was not expecting that answer. He's expecting me to say, well, you got to do this and that. And you know, we can do all these things. We'll fix it for you. I said, you can't. And he just looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, here's why I say that. You can't help them because you don't know what you believe. And I said it very tactfully and respectfully, but it was very true. He did not know what he believed about Genesis. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it says six days, but, you know, the radiometric dating and the Big Bang and all that, we, we just don't know. He's, he was a pastor at that church for probably 18 years. Great guy. Smart guy, super nice, super sincere, but he just stayed away from Genesis because the church stays away from Genesis. They don't really take a stance. It doesn't matter. There are different views out there. What do we care? We're just here to worship Jesus. Well, that, that's a big problem, and it leads to the problem that they're having with their youth. And I said, think about it. So think about it this way. You're having this problem, so you bring in some expert. This is a generic person. It's not supposed to be any month specific. So you bring in someone, and this person is incredible. Not only are they a Bible scholar, they're a scientist, a really smart scientist. So you bring them in to help the youth who are struggling and walking away. And this is what this expert says. Genesis may or may not be just poetry, because, I mean, there are different ways of looking at it, you know, and we're just not quite sure if it's supposed to be literal or not. God may or may not have created everything in six literal days. I, I know that's what the text says, but again, you could look at it differently. It could be just poetry. Uh, God may or may not have used the Big Bang. I mean, there's so, I mean, the scientists basically proven it, right? And they got all this evidence, and so it looks like it, maybe it happened, and maybe it fits in the Bible. We're not quite sure on that one. Life may or may not have originated from non-living chemicals. I mean, they're doing all these experiments in the laboratory, and they're making great progress. So, we're, you know, there's good people on both sides. You know, we're just not quite sure. Animals may or may not have evolved from a common ancestor. I mean, that's the whole evolution thing. And, and man, there just seems like all these fossils and things. Well, I mean, maybe that did happen. We may or may not have evolved from an ape-like creature because you go to the museums. They've got ape men, and the bones are right there. I mean, so... Maybe God used that process. We're just not quite sure. Again, good, good people on both sides. Uh, there may or may not have been an, an actual Adam and Eve. I mean, the Bible does talk about them. So maybe God did that, but maybe he transformed two ape-like creatures into the first hominoids or something. He called them Adam and Eve, or maybe it's just symbolic again, you know, some people think. Uh, there may or may not have been a literal original sin. Again, if you didn't have a literal Adam and Eve, there wasn't then a specific one sin. It's just kind of that we're all sinful in general or, or something, you know, maybe. Um, there may or may not have been an actual flood. I know the Bible talks about one, but, you know, 
geologists don't seem to believe in a worldwide flood. And even if there was a flood, it may or may not have been global. Maybe, maybe there was a flood, but it was just like this local event that happened, you know, wherever Noah was living. So good luck in college. I hope that helps. <laughs> and the youth are sitting there thinking, just how is that supposed to help me? But then I told this pastor, so literally, what else could you do when you say you don't know? And you're telling the youth, this is so complex that even we as a leadership in this church, we can't, we can't even figure it out. And we've studied the experts, and they don't really know because they're going back and forth, and so just, ah, whatever. That's what we're telling them when we don't take a stance. And I don't expect pastors to be able to give science lectures, but it would be nice if they could say, no, right or wrong. Here's what I believe. I believe that God created everything in six days because when I read Genesis and I look even at the Hebrew, it just kind of screams, these are literal days, so we got to deal with it. Because if God created over billions of years, he could have said that. But he didn't. So I have a feeling he didn't create over billions of years. And so let's take a look at it further. And then when you actually start bringing some of the science and you're like, oh, okay, that's why the radiometric states are off. And if I went into a lecture right now, I could actually keep it really simple. You'd be like, oh, my word, that stuff's not so impressive. They're really picking and choosing what they want. And it doesn't prove billions of years. There's a lot of things that prove just the opposite. That would be a whole other talk that we could go into. We're going to do an interesting exercise next, but it's not one of these exercises. No one's going to pull a muscle or get hurt. (laughs) Um, What we're going to do is I'm going to read through a passage, and you're going to read through it with me. And this is really important. Don't pull a muscle when you're reading through this. Just relax. Seriously, don't overthink it. We're just going to read through it, okay? And here's what it says. A newspaper is better than a magazine. A seashore is a better place than the street. At first, it's better to run than to walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Once successful, complications are minimal. Birds seldom get too close. Rain, however, soaks in very fast. Too many many people doing the same thing can also cause problems. One needs lots of room. If there are no complications, it can be very peaceful. A rock will serve as an anchor. If things break loose from it, however, you will not get a second chance. And you're all thinking, what in the world? (laughs) You understood every sentence, but it just didn't seem to fit together. No no cohesion there. Okay, we're going to reread this. But this time, I want you to picture something in your mind as you're reading it. I want you to all picture this, a kite. So think about a kite as we reread this passage. A newspaper is better than a magazine. A seashore is a better place than the street. At first, it's better to run than to walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Once successful, complications are minimal. Birds seldom get too close. Rain, however, soaks in very fast. Too many people doing the same thing can also or can cause problems. One needs lots of room. If there are no complications, it can be very peaceful. A rock will serve as an anchor. If things break loose from it, however, you will not get a second chance. Isn't that kind of fun? I heard this years ago and I thought, I got to fit this into a talk somehow. (laughs) It's just, it's so cool. Something that made no sense whatsoever makes perfect sense when you have the right thing in mind. And guess what? The Bible is our kite. The Bible is our rock. It's our anchor. It helps us make sense of everything. 2 Samuel 7. O Lord, you are God and your words are true. Psalm 119, 160. The sum of your word is true. Then every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So when the world is throwing all these things at us, it's not that any individual item is too tough to handle. It's that they're overwhelming the system. There are so many, and there's actually even more than these. Well, just one quick side note, and I have to be very sensitive with these things because these are real issues for many people. So I never make fun of any of them. I don't make fun of anyone who's struggling with it. People are really battling with with some of these issues. Just as a side note, I like to think of things very logically with my engineering and physics background and I did computer programming for 12 years. You just, you got to be logical with that. Um, So I was thinking about this the other day 
And I thought this, if a man ever walked up to me and he told me this, that I identify as a woman, I would have one question for him. And here's the question. What is a woman? See, if he tries to define a woman, he's shooting himself in the foot because what? They're trying to get away from saying, well, a woman is generally, they're generally not as strong as a man. Their hair is usually longer. They're more soft-spoken. Their voice is a little bit higher frequency. And all these, no, you, gotta, you, can't, you can't label a woman and put them in a box like that. They're trying to totally get away from any of that. Well, if you can't define a woman, how do you know you identify as one? <laughs> And if you say you identify as one, you're admitting, I'm not one. I just identify as one. And, and it, this goes on and on and on. If you just think through it logically, like someone would say, a man could say, I identify as a woman, and I demand that you recognize me, that I identify as a woman, and you use those pronouns, she and her, or whatever they're going to say. And I could just say, well, I identify as someone who identifies you as a man. So you have to accept that, that I identify as someone who sees you as a man. Now, you know, game over in a sense. So, and I'm not expecting to share any of this and someone's going to say, oh, I never thought of that. You're right. Let me go to church and worship Jesus. This is not just a logical argument. This is a spiritual battle that's going on and we need to be sensitive to some people are really struggling with these things. And I understand why. Because of the background that they have and all the garbage that they've been told, it's no, sh it's no shock or wonder that they're wondering about these things. So again, I'm sensitive to these things, but there are so many, and this is a very, very important point. These issues aren't wrong because they're problematic. They're problematic because they're wrong, meaning that they go against God's created order. And very, very quickly, climate change, I'm just pulling that up, some of these things are in a little different category. It's not proper to say that climate change is right or wrong. Climate change is climate change. It just it is what it is. What might be wrong is our understanding of it or our response to it. So it's not right just to say that all these are, are just flat out wrong. It's, we have to look at them a little differently. But we don't look at things and say, wow, those are just really causing problems. And so I guess we're going to say those are wrong. We say, no, I'm not surprised that those are causing problems because they go against God's created order. So we need to always take everything back to the authority of Scripture. It is our starting point. That's why our ministry is a starting point project. Everything you could ever possibly bring up could be rooted in God's Word. Yeah. So when someone brings up any topic, no matter what it is, you could say, hold on a second, let me see what God says about that. And if they don't like what you share with them, it's not your philosophy versus theirs. You're just helping them understand God's Word. And they'll have to give an account to God about what he said. You're just the middleman helping them understand what God says about these things. And we want to do it very graciously, very kindly. So why does any of this even matter? Well, again, as I mentioned, origin determines purpose. The origin of something determines its purpose. So even your origin determines your purpose. If I showed you this piece of equipment and asked you what is its purpose, most of you would not know. But if you knew its origin, if you knew who the manufacturer was, they could tell you this is why we made it, this is what it's used for, then you could figure out it's a proximity probe, it measures vibration, uh, vibration analysis and rotational equipment. My first job, <clears throat> job out of college, I did field service engineering and worked on these pieces of equipment. But the point is, if you know the origin of something, then you could figure out its purpose. Well, again, it's the same thing with everyone here this morning. Your origin determines your purpose. If you really believe that the universe came about through a Big Bang, guess what? There is no purpose for the Big Bang. Again, many religious people and Christians say, well, God used the Big Bang. Someone had to start it, you know. Okay, yeah, but the Big Bang is not even a good scientific theory. It's really not. It's part of another talk that I give talking more about the Big Bang. And the scientists who drafted the Big Bang, they did so in order, in an effort to explain the origin of the universe apart from God. So when we come along and say, well, that's, yep, God did that, they're like, we don't need you. We're trying to explain everything apart from the supernatural. It is a purposeless model of how the universe appeared. And if there's no purpose for this universe, and you are a subsequent part of that universe, there is no purpose for your life either. You can make one up. You might want to save the spotted owl. Great. What does that do for you when you're laying on your deathbed? Nothing. 
There is really no ultimate purpose for you. Here's a quote from William Provine. He's from Cornell University. He was an atheist. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. And I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposeful forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all. That's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. Very depressing, but very consistent with an atheistic worldview. He's right. If there is no God, everything he said is true. There's no purpose in life. It's just things are what they are. We might make up things along the way. We don't like this. Okay, let's make a law. No, that's going to be wrong because we decided it is. But there's no ultimate purpose. There's no ultimate evil. Murder isn't wrong you know, intrinsically. It's wrong because we got together as society and said, oh, that looks bad. We're going to say that's wrong and make a law. No, we got together as society and said, we know murder is wrong because God has intrinsically put that in our heart, that murder is wrong. Because we know that, we said, we should have a law so that if someone does murder someone, we've already decided what we're going to do about it. That's where the laws come from. The laws come from a recognition of God's moral law and moral character. So, another you know, atheist we talked about before, Stephen Hawking, the world's leading theoretical physicist. Uh, he had to address this question of getting something from nothing. In fact, he had to talk about getting everything from nothing because he was an atheist. So, if there is no God, where did everything come from? Here was his response. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. No, most of you probably don't want to argue with the world's leading theoretical physicist. <laughs> but let's just take a closer look at what he said. Forget about how smart he is. He was super smart, brilliant guy. Just forget about his background and just analyze what he said because statements have to stand on their own. We don't say something's true just because somebody said it. So I'm going to reword this slightly. Because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Wait a minute, if you have something, you don't have nothing. <laughs> And what was the something he referred to? The law of gravity. What is the law of gravity? It's not a physical thing that you can weigh and paint and bend. It's a description of how the universe operates. But you can't have a description of how the universe operates unless you have a universe to describe. But if you have a universe to describe, you're not creating it from nothing. It already exists. So here's an example of a statement from a truly brilliant scientist that makes no sense. Even other atheists called him out on it. It doesn't make any sense. This is not an explanation of how something came from nothing. So the Big Bang means no purpose whatsoever. But if you believe in God, that he designed the universe, there would be a purpose for the universe. And if you're part of that universe, there would be a purpose for your life too. So we're going to take a look at that. Psalm 139 and 14, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. This is so true. The more we look at things scientifically, the more we just think, oh my word, this is probably an understatement in a sense. But we got the yeah, but because the scientists have proven evolution and all that. We're not designed by God. Everything just evolved over millions and billions of years. Again, but if we don't believe Moses' writings, how will we believe Jesus' words? Well, again, who is Jesus? This is another important point. Long before Jesus was Savior, he was Creator. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, for him, by him, through him, all things were created. So if we're going to take Jesus serious as our Savior, we need to take him just as seriously as our creator. And so we need to pay very, very close attention to that. So here's a cell. A typical human adult has about 100 trillion cells in their body, and each one of those cells is more complex than the space shuttle. And inside the nucleus there... That's where the DNA is. If you pull that out, it would be from just one cell, microscopic cell. It would be about six feet long. So you go into this tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic cell into the nucleus, pull out the DNA, it would be about six feet long. Super, super thin to fit in there, but it would be about six feet long. If you were to magnify that nucleus, it was about 10 microns. If you magnified it so it became the size of a basketball, now the DNA that was six feet, when we pull that out, it's 27 miles long. So picture holding a basketball. That's the nucleus of one of your cells. And you reach in there to pull out the DNA. you got to pull it out to unravel it, to read some of it, to do, make some proteins and all that. Pull out 27 miles of it. And then get it back in there just right, fold it just right. 
Because it won't function properly if you don't get it all back in there. That's what's going on inside your bodies all day long, every day of your life. If you took out all of the DNA, not just one cell that we've been talking about, every single cell in your body took out all of the DNA in your body and lined it up end to end, you'd be dead. So don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) But let's say you did and you wanted to walk that distance. So here's your DNA lined up end to end and now you want to go for a little walk. You can walk maybe two and a half miles an hour. How long would it take you to get to the end of your own DNA? So it's in your body. You take it out, line it up. We're going to go for a little walk. Think it would take you five minutes? Hour and a half? How about 3,706,339 years? Seriously, to walk to the end of your own DNA. It's in your body right now. It would take you that long to walk. Well... That's a long, long distance. It would reach from the earth to the sun. That's 93 million miles, but not just once. Over 1,200 times your DNA would span that distance. Absolutely amazing. So let's say we wanted to travel that far. We don't want to walk. That's too slow. Let's say we could go the speed of the Apollo astronauts, over 3,100 miles per hour. That is really, really fast. I did another calculation, and I figured out that's almost as fast as my wife drives. (laughs) Just kidding. She drives much, much faster. Uh, (laughs) um, So now you're going the speed of the Apollo astronauts. How long would it take you to get to the end of your own DNA? Half a second? A thousandth of a second? How about 4,180 years going the speed of a spaceship? That's just amazing. But that's just too slow. we got to speed things up here a little bit. So how about Star Wars? We're going to go the speed of light. Over 670 million miles per hour, that's 186,000 miles per second. Every second, you're going 186,000 miles. How long is that going to take you? A billionth of a second? Seven full days traveling at the speed of light to get to the end of your own DNA. Yeah, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image, male and female. So God created them in the garden, right? No, but the scientists have proven evolution. We've evolved from an ape like creature, and Darwin proved that, and the scientists today, they got more and more evidence. We need, we need to just give up our view of the Bible, right? Because we need to tell, uh, believe whatever the scientists are telling us. Again, Richard Dawkins, the atheist. It's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Very dogmatic statement from a very intelligent scientist. So how are our kids going to respond sitting in a class where the teacher or professor makes a statement like that? They raise their hand and say, I don't necessarily believe in all the evolution stuff. They're instantly labeled by everyone around them. Well, you're one of these ignorant people. You're one of these crazy people. You reject science. You just believe the Bible. So they become very quiet, and many end up walking away from their faith. So we, again, we have the yeah, but we know what Scripture says. Yeah, but the scientists have proven so much stuff. I mean, you got the ape men. You go to the museums; they've got real bones there, right? How? I mean, seriously, this this book was written a long time ago, before we had science. Today we have science, and they've got literal bones. You go there; they have real bones. How in the world can you possibly argue with that? Well, let's take a look real quick. Here's a classic example. This is Hesperopithecus Harold Cookii. <laughs> This just means ape from the Western world, and it was discovered by a guy named Harold Cook. (laughs) So that's where they came up with the name, but they give them these elaborate names and make it sound very scientific and intimidating. The common name was Nebraska Man because they found the bones in Wyoming, right? No. Um, (laughs) So the evidence was found in Nebraska. They call him Nebraska Man. So look at this guy. Everything you'd want in an ape man. Got a very, very brutish face, longer hair. He's got a club like Stone Age tools, so more intelligent than a regular ape. Uh, behind him is his wife, and she's making a fire. And above her, we have some domesticated animals. Those are horses there, and we have camels off to the side there. So, wow, they were able to determine a lot about Nebraska. And that's pretty impressive. What was the evidence that they found? It must have been pretty amazing. One bone, and that bone was a tooth. How do you take one tooth and make a whole ape man? How tall was he? How long was his hair? Would his face look brutish? Did he know about Stone Age tools and fire and domesticated animals and all that? You wouldn't know any of those things. 
Turned out later they found more of those teeth. It came from an extinct pig. <laughs> so they literally took one pig's tooth and made a whole ape man out of it. It was in textbooks for many years. They had to throw it out. Like, okay, that, that one doesn't count, but they, they've got other ones, right? So this Nebraska man is, is gone. Now we have the Anthropus Dawsoni Piltdown Man. What was the evidence for this? Um, some bones from a human skull and some bones from an ape jaw. The discoverer told everyone he found them on the same skeleton. So the skull looks kind of human, but it kind of looked ape-like because of the jaw was more like an ape and, and the teeth and stuff. But the skull looked more like a human, so there's your ape man. It's perfect, right? The world's leading experts couldn't tell. This guy filed the teeth down to make him look more flat like human teeth rather than ape teeth. And then he discolored the bones to make him look older. This was in the textbooks for 40 years. Think about, I mean, many of your children, or at least, you know, uh, at least children, maybe some grandchildren, have gone through learning about Nebraska man, or Piltdown man, proof of evolution for 40 years. Again, some of you grew up, grew up with that. So how do you argue with that? They've got the bones, you've got pictures and all these things. Well, there's a fraud, and they, so they had to finally throw that one out. A little bit more current example they're still talking about today, Australopithecus afarensis. This just means southern ape from the far region of Africa. They also call her Lucy. Look at Lucy's eyes, specifically the whites of the eyes. Gorillas and apes don't have whites of their eyes, so why did they put whites of the eyes in Lucy? The eyes certainly weren't preserved. They wanted to make her look more human because Lucy pretty much looked like a chimpanzee. They try to twist different things to make it look somewhat human, and they, they even would, they, they actually admitted they posed her in the museums to make it look like she was deep in thought, contemplating things, more like a human being. A little humor break here, I love the far side. Rocking the anthropological world, a second Lucy is discovered in southern Uganda. <laughs> That's my kind of humor. I just think that that's just great. <laughs> so back to Lucy. Here are some of the details. It was discovered by Donald Johansson in 1974. And what about the name, the, the common name, Lucy? Why do they call her Lucy? Well, where they were digging in their camp, they were listening to some music by a group called the Beatles. And they were listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And so they just called this first find. They called her Lucy. So that's where the name comes from. A little bit of free trivia. won't charge you for that one. So they found about 20% of the skeleton clade. It was three and a half million years old and that it walked upright. Okay. This is what Lucy looks like in the museums today. Take a look, just as one example, at Lucy's feet. They look very much like human feet, not like chimpanzee feet. Why? When they found Lucy, this first skeleton, they didn't find the foot bones or the hand bones. So why did they put human feet on Lucy? They didn't find those bones. Well, about a 1,000 miles away, they found human footprints. If humans were already around leaving those footprints, Lucy is not on her way to evolving into a human being. Humans already exist. So they said, ah, Lucy must have left those footprints. She must have had human-like feet. She was over there, you know. And So they just put human feet on Lucy. Well, since this time, they have found more of the skeletons of these australopithecines, and they did find the foot bones. And they're long and curved, just like a chimpanzee, but they don't bother changing the museums. You know how much money that costs to change the, change the museums around? And it would destroy their story. So next time you see Lucy in the museums, take a look at her feet and remember that. And there are many, many, many more examples. I have another series of talks where I go through each uh, of these in detail. But we could summarize this whole ape-man thing this way. Every ape man you have ever seen or ever will see falls into one of three categories. It was either really just an ape or chimpanzee that they tried to make look more human. That would be Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. Or on the other end, it was really fully human that they tried to make look more brutish, like Neanderthal man. Most secular scientists today believe that Neanderthal man, they were perfectly human. In fact, Asians and Europeans have 2 to 3% Neanderthal DNA in them because they were intermarrying in the past and having children. Well, you can only do that with humans. <laughs> so we know that there were a different subgroup of humans that got separated off after the flood and the Ice Age and all that, um, but they tried to make them look very brutish in the museums, but they were fully human. The third category 
is a mixture or a fraud. That would have been Piltdown Man or the Sadiba, where you have some bones of some apes and some bones of humans. Often when they find bones, they're just fragmented and all over the place. And some, yeah, look kind of human. Some look kind of ape-like because there were humans and apes living together at the same time. But they put them on the same skeleton to make an ape-man out of it. So that kind of summarizes the whole ape-man thing. But then you hear this too, that human DNA is 98 or 99% identical to chimpanzees. How many have ever heard that before? Uh, that's in our school systems. This is complete myth. Not even close to this. They cheated to get that number to begin with. Uh, don't have time for all the details, but when they were first doing the comparison, they had the human genome mapped, kind of understood what the DNA was doing, but they had a small percentage of the chimpanzee genome, and they started comparing. And any segments that didn't match up well, they just chucked <laughs> The ones that did match up, they're like, wow, look at this, matches up so well. Well, guess what? If we both digest our food the same way, the DNA to do that is going to be very, very similar, if not identical. And even on a cellular level, our cells have to reproduce themselves, don't they? They have to bring in nutrients. They have to process those things. They have to communicate. All those things are the same even in bananas, that we share about half of our genes with bananas. Seriously, because so much that goes on is just at the cellular level, copying cells, repairing them, processing nutrients and things like that. So there's going to be a high level of similarity to a certain point. And they were saying 98, 99. No, now it's down to probably 80 or lower, which is totally throwing them off. It doesn't make any sense if we actually evolve from an ape-like creature. But it's still in the school systems. And very quick, one other comment. The schools are not teaching these things because the teachers are trying to lie about anything or the professors at the universities. My view, most teachers in public schools and state university professors are very nice people. They're good teachers, and they're pretty sincere. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that they're teaching is not true, but they don't even know it. It's been disproven, but it doesn't trickle down to their level or to the textbooks. So they're just teaching the same thing that they learned. They're, they're teaching the only thing they've ever heard. Again, unfortunately, a lot of it's not true, but they're not out there just trying to lie every single day. I'm sure some are somewhere, but most of them aren't. So this is a Newsweek cover. It was the search for Adam and Eve. They were not looking for the Genesis, literal Adam and Eve. They were looking for the first male and female that we've all come from. It was very, very interesting. Uh, but Because they say the biblical Adam and Eve is just a myth. Here's their view of the standard origins of man. We've got chimpanzees up here, and we've got humans, and they believe we have both evolved from a common ancestor starting about six million years ago. One branch went off into the chimps, apes, and orangutans and gorillas. The other branch went off into all the hominoids and ape men and eventually modern man. So we share a common ancestor. They don't believe we've evolved from a chimpanzee. They believe the chimp and the human had a common ancestor that branched off. That's what they teach about human origins. So back to this Adam and Eve. Why were they searching for one male and one female? Because guess what? They really do believe today that we have all evolved from one male and one female. <laughs> Why is that? Because of studying the genome here. Males are the only ones who have a Y chromosome. So by studying the Y chromosome, we can tell that, wow, we must have come from a single copy that was copied over and over, and anything else that existed must have died out. They do believe we have all come from one male. And females are the only ones that pass on the mitochondrial DNA. Most of our DNA is in the nucleus, but the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, has some DNA. Females are the only ones who pass on those loops of DNA. So by studying that, they have figured we have all come from one female. But don't get excited. This is not the Bible stuff. This male and female didn't even live together at the same time. It seems kind of funny, like, how does, how does that work? It actually could work genetically. I won't go into the details, but they're saying, no, this is not a match of the Bible thing, so don't get excited. That's what they're saying. Well, breaking news, genetic Adam and Eve did not live too far apart in time. After all, this is what they say. Why chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve, this first male and female, were thought to have lived tens of thousands of years apart? Now, two major studies suggest that they may have lived around the same time after all. Well, who knew? Who would ever thought of that? <laughs> oh, yeah, the Bible would have thought of that. The Bible said in Genesis 1 that God created male and female on day 6. They were created together at the same time on the very same day. Further interesting information. Population bottleneck. Breaking news. When humans faced extinction, secular scientists believed that almost everyone on the planet went extinct, except for a small group. 
that survived and repopulated the earth. Sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> Humans may have come close to extinction about 70,000 years ago, according to the latest genetic research. Okay. Don't get hung up on the 70,000 year number. Just put it in context. They believe we have been evolving for 6 million years. 70,000 years would be very recent in their scheme of things. 70,000 years ago was very recently. So they're saying, recently, we almost all went extinct. And then we repopulated the earth. So visually, it looks like this. You have an original population, great genetic variety, all the different colors of the circles here. Then a catastrophic event occurs, which wipes out most of that variety. And now we only have the red and the blue ones that survive. And then those have to repopulate the rest of the planet. So you lose a lot of this diversity. So this is what happened. When the secular scientists were studying our genetics for people all over the planet, they were expecting to see this massive genetic diversity. But what they actually saw was they're all very, very, very closely related. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. If we've been evolving for six million years, it should have just kept spreading out. But it's really narrow. So they said, oh, okay. Yeah, and it probably did get really wide. And then almost everyone was wiped out and a small group survived. And not too long ago, they started repopulating the earth, so it hasn't had time to spread out yet. So that's why it's so narrow. We're so closely related. That's what they're saying. In the book, Why is Evolution True? by Jerry Coyne at University of Chicago, he said it's theorized, based on genetic evidence, that a few tens of thousands of years ago, the population of Homo sapiens was reduced for a period to a few thousand or tens of thousands of people. Such a bottleneck would explain the extremely low level of genetic diversity found within our species. And then an update. An abrupt population bottleneck specific to human males has been inferred five to 7,000 years before present. So now they're, they're looking at it further and they're saying, now it looks like maybe five to 7,000 years ago there was this repopulation. Why does that sound so familiar? Well, oh, and one bonus here, those are people. Now we're going to take a look at the genetics of animals. They started studying the genetics of animals and came to this conclusion. A straightforward hypothesis is that almost all existing animal species have a ride from mitochondrial uniformity. That's that bottleneck, catastrophic event, within the last one to several hundred thousand years. Let's summarize this here. Humans almost went extinct recently. Animals almost went extinct recently. Animals and humans re-emerged at the same time time. Well, again, you take a look at the biblical narrative. The Bible says there was a flood about four and a half thousand years ago. That's close to that 5,000 year number that they were coming up with. You had eight human beings and two of each kind of animal coming off the ark to repopulate roughly 5,000 years ago. That's what modern genetics is screaming. <laughs> and one male and one female. No surprise. It's very, very exciting. So wrapping this up, who am I? The origins, the reality, and the relevance. The reality is that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, created to do good works. The relevance, this brings us back to the Yabbat. Now, the Yabbat has been very negative up to this point. We're going to use it slightly different. At some point in your life, you're going to die. You don't ask me one, I won't tell you. But at some point, it's going to happen. You're going to be standing before God, more likely kneeling. And God could look at you and say, you do not deserve to get into heaven. And that's when you pull the yeah, but. And you say, yeah, I don't. But you sent your son to die on a cross to pay my penalty so that I could get in. And God says, enter into all eternity. <laughs> um, so the yeah, but can be a very good thing. So we are created in the image of God. We messed up that relationship that we have with our creator and God could have just smashed us and started over. But he said, no, I love you too much. I got a plan. His plan was that he sent his son to die on a cross 2,000 years ago. And Jesus said, not only am I going to do that, I'm coming back again. And for any of those who, who realize that they're not good enough to have that fellowship back with their creator again, and that and the ultimate price needs to be paid, of perfection, which Jesus was, for anyone who says, I can't be good enough to meet God's standard, but Jesus Christ was, and he paid my price. I am accepting that as a free gift. I can't earn it. I can never be good enough to earn it, but I'm, I'm taking it and thanking God, repenting of my sins, thanking him for this gift. And now on that basis, and that basis alone, I can spend eternity with my creator. And it makes all the difference in the world as you look at all these other issues coming at you. 
and how to respond to other people who are sincerely struggling with those issues. We need to get them back to the authority of God's word. Because think of it this way. If they bring up gay marriage, transgenderism, whatever the topic is, and if you start arguing with them about transgenderism, well, it kind of causes some emotional problems here and there and this and that. You know, they're going to have some statistics that say, well, we've got counselors now who can really help them through that, and they'll be just fine, and we've got doctors who can help them with some of the physical changes to their body, and they're, they're, they should be able to adjust well with all the drugs we've come up with and on and on. And you're going back and forth. You're not getting anywhere. You could say, you know what, why I think there's a struggle and why I think that God actually created just two genders, male and female, is because of what the Bible says. Oh, you, you can't bring your religion into this. You've got to leave the Bible out of this. Most Christians at that point will say, well, you know, okay. And then they go back to arguing statistics and, you know, life, real life stories and experiences they've had or whatever, and you just don't really get anywhere. You should never say, well, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll leave the Bible out of this. Never. You believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. They believe it's not. They're asking you to give up your foundation, that you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And you say, okay. They're not giving up theirs. They believe the Bible is not the inspired word of God, and they will argue their point from that foundation, that the Bible is not the inspired word of God. You can't bring it into this. So they're asking you to give up your foundation, your only weapon, and you say, okay. And now you go into the fight without a gun, in a sense. (laughs) What you should say is, you know what? I do believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and you believe it's not. Let's just both admit that and go from there. And if they're really struggling with this, you could say, this is really the issue. Because if you believe this was the inspired word of God, all these other things you're bringing up kind of take care of themselves. So rather than spinning our wheels up here, why don't we get back to this? If we can make some headway, these things will fall in line. If we can't get anywhere with this, it doesn't really pay to talk about these things that much because this is their real issue. They're never going to be standing before God and he's going to ask them all about transgenderism and all these things. No, he's going to ask them one question. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? That's right. We need to get the conversation back to the authority of God's word and the Holy Spirit will help guide that. That way you don't have to be an expert in the statistics. Are people born that way? Is that true or is that not? You don't, you don't have to know all those things in depth. And even if you did, someone would just have a different opinion. Well, I know some psychologists or this doctor or this scientist and You know, here's my article. Well, here's my article. Here's my article. Well, I have two scientists. Well, I have four scientists. Well, these guys have two PhDs. Well, I got this guy. He's got eight PhDs. And just like, you never get anywhere. It's got to be rooted in the authority of God's word, which means we need to be confident in this when we go out and ultimately share the gospel message and not try to just argue with these issues that come up but get to the gospel message. That's the only place where there's any power. So with that... And that's probably my last slide. we got a bunch of resources. I'm not going to go through all the details. Everything is online as well as at our table. All of our videos now are streamable. So we have the physical DVDs, plus you can actually stream all of our videos. Um, I've got a brand new book that just came out a few weeks ago. The ink is still wet. Uh, Faith is not a four-letter word. We have a DVD of it too, but it just came out in book form. And in December, I have another book coming out, Creation to Christ, the Old Testament, in a nutshell. Um, These are our two newer DVDs, uh, The Inspiration of the Bible. I used to have just a single talk on that. Now we have a five-part series, and then The Flood came out about a year ago. Uh, It's a four-part series on the Genesis Flood. Very powerful, very interesting. And we have one of everything specials. You can get all the DVDs, both books, um, or you can get the streaming version of that. We have a free monthly email newsletter. You can sign up at our table, or you can go online. It comes out just once a month. We've done a lot of live stream broadcasts, which we have on our website, which you can watch for free. And the monthly newsletter, I write a question of the month every month. Uh, You can see that on our website, and you'll also get it if you sign up for our newsletter. And then an engagement request form if you want me to speak somewhere else. Maybe you used to live in California, you have an uncle who's a pastor in Utah, or whatever it is. Just fill out a form, turn it into us, and we'll help you with how to best get us connected. It usually... um, has to do with you talking to whomever you know at that other church and asking them if they would accept a phone call from me. That's all you have to do. You don't have to explain our ministry and all the details. Just say, could Jay give you a call? And if they say, yeah, okay. Then you get a hold of me and you say, yeah, I talked to him. He said, call him Wednesday mornings or Thursday afternoons, and I'll take over from there. So, But you can fill out that form if you're interested in that. Again, we also do Grand Canyon tours. we got two uh, scheduled for sure, but we can also do a name Name your own date. Uh, I'm going to do some custom tours, too. We basically spend one day walking along the South Rim, looking one mile down to the Colorado River, talking about 
how that all happened uh, from a catastrophic standpoint in the Genesis flood. Then the next day, we're actually on the river. We go around the famous horseshoe bend. It's just absolutely beautiful. All along the way, we give little mini scientific lectures showing that the Genesis flood, Genesis 6 through 8, actually happened in the Grand Canyon. one of the best places you can go to see it. So if you're interested, one of the best things to do is get a group from a church together. You can go and and Pastor Bob can come with you. It's just phenomenal. It's literally life-changing because it's not just uh, something cool to see, but when you tie it into Scripture or all the specifics, it gets you so fired up about the authority of God's Word. And then you run out, not to talk about the flood, but you run out to share the gospel message, knowing if they bring up creation or the flood or anything, you like, you know answers exist. So those flyers are on our table if you're interested in either any of those dates or um, custom date. So not clicking any further. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but I appreciate you guys being comfortable with me coming back. Hopefully, Pastor Bob has, doesn't have to do too much damage control. But uh, I hope you're encouraged, again, to be in God's Word, to be looking for opportunities. The world is upside down. I have news for you. As far as I know, it's not going to get any better. It's probably going to continue to get, you know, this will be normal, and then it'll get worse, and that'll be normal, get worse. God doesn't ask you to change the world. He asks you to evangelize, make disciples. And the worse the world is, the easier it should be to share the hope that we have. So we're looking for opportunities to share your faith in Jesus Christ. Share it with others who aren't there yet. Do it in a very gracious manner. I will close in a word of prayer. look forward to seeing you in the lobby afterwards and then uh, watching my wife eat chili. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this time that you've given us to take a look at the authority of your word. I thank you for each person here this morning. I pray that you would be using them all in unique ways. They are all in situations that I have not been in or never will be. They know people I will never meet. So I pray that you would equip them specifically to be better positioned to share the gospel message in a very gracious and kind way so that ultimately others would come to know you as their personal Savior. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys want to stand with us? Thank you, Jim. We have, um, I think, 13 different types of chili. And it's going to be an amazing, we do it every year, annual chili cook-off, and it's in the cafe. Uh, we'll, end, we'll exit through these uh, foyer doors, and then uh, through the back hallway will be the line, and uh, we'll go that way. They'll have the Packer game on later, I should say, the Bear game on in a little bit. But bless you guys, and uh, we have a chance to worship on the way out today. Let's do it.
blesses food to our bodies. Amen. Have a great Sunday.